Thanks for joining Stop Running from Your Problem List, Strategies for Streamlining the EHR's Front Page webinar. Um, my name is Jordan Leibowitz, and I'm part of the marketing team here at IMO. And before we get started, I want to take care of a few items for those attending. First off, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to you for future viewing. And throughout the session today, all attendees will be in listen mode. And if you have any questions, please type them into the questions section um, on your GoToWebinar console. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. But if for any reason yours is not addressed, um, we'll follow up with you after the web webinar. Uh, today, we have two speakers, Dr. Amanda Heidman, she's CMIO at CMIO Services, LLC, and Dr. Jim Thompson, who's a physician informaticist here at IMO. So as mentioned before, if you have any questions or comments while our presenters are speaking, uh, please type them into the questions on your control panel. And with all of this being said, I'll pass it over to Dr. Thompson. Hey folks, uh, Jim Thompson here, physician informaticist with IMO. Uh, I'm really excited about today's topic. Uh, most of my clinical career uh, is, has been spent in one way or another dealing with the problem list, either from the perspective of the user, the perspective of a CMIO, or the perspective of a vendor. And uh, what we want to focus on today in general is a governance of the problem list itself, but a little bit of background first. Um, this webinar is coming to you from IMO. We're the innovator in clinical interface terminology. We've been in the industry for about 25 years or so. We have an international presence and a pretty strong presence here in the United States as well. A half a million physicians use our solutions every single day, representing something like 4,500 hospitals. Uh, our terminology is in probably more than 70% of US acute care facilities. So why should we care about the problem list? Well, if you're a clinician, that ends up being kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, and so to introduce the topic of the problem list in general, I thought I'd put this illustration up. This is, in fact, a real-world problem list. Now it's about 10 years um, since I first came across this. A colleague came up to me in the emergency department one day and said, JT, you're not going to believe what this woman just handed me as her problem list. So you don't have to have much experience as a clinician or even a non-clinician to realize this kind of problem list is not going to help you. And I think as I talk to clinicians across the country, every single one of them has stories about the problem list, whether it's helpful or unhelpful and some of the things that they've seen out there. Uh, that being said, uh, let me turn to Amanda and uh, maybe Amanda, you could talk a little bit about some of your experiences with the problem list. Sure, Jim. Uh, you know, it's always interesting to see how we encounter some of the EHR features in the wild. You know, everything is designed with the best of intentions, and I think it's implemented in organizations with the best of intentions, but sometimes things just go uh, a little off kilter at times. And, and that's where I tend to come in. So as a consulting CMIO, our organizations will bring me in to, to address pain points for their clinicians or pain points within the EHR. And a lot of times uh, practices really don't understand or organizations don't really understand just the importance of that problem list and everything that it's trying to do. So it's, it's not just necessarily a list of uh, things that are important to the patient or conditions that are going on with the patient. Sometimes it's used as a trigger for uh, preventive care. It could be used as a trigger for uh, chronic disease management. It could be used as a trigger for um, programs such as HCC coding and, and accountable care organizations. And it's really important for folks to understand the problem list, how it's supposed to work longitudinally. I think a lot of us um, want it to be the definitive list of everything that's going on with the patient. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to include every single encounter diagnosis that the patient has had. And I think we saw a little bit of that in the example Jim just showed. You know, there are things that patients have that are self-limited. You know, I come in, uh, you know, I broke my finger, it resolves. That doesn't necessarily have to stay on the problem list unless it's becoming a problem. Um, and organizations really need to understand the difference between just a list of diagnoses that the patient has had and a truly functional problem list. And, and I'll give you an example of uh, something that I've seen. Um, organizations also need to understand who's going to own the problem list. And that's a big piece of what we're going to talk about today, the governance of the problem list, who's responsible for it. 
And one of the first projects that I was brought into as a consulting CMIO was a problem list cleanup for kind of a mid-sized physician group. So um, a, a, a provider association who had implemented an EHR. And what they did is they brought up primary care first, um, as many organizations do, and then they started to add the subspecialists, but they didn't fully explain to folks what the problem list was supposed to do. So the primary care docs very diligently created their problem lists, made them very specific and detailed, included a lot of things. And then when some of the subspecialists came on, uh, they saw all these things on the problem list and they didn't wanna see all those things. They just wanted to see their problems. So we actually had a group of uh, a handful of gastroenterology docs who quote cleaned up the problem lists but what they did is they actually removed other people's data um, because the organization did not have their permission set up correctly to make sure that uh, that couldn't happen uh, the clinicians didn't have an understanding of what would happen if they hit delete on that problem list and it, it was a big mess and the way that i came into it um, was i do some forensic database work and my job was to parse those transaction logs and try to recreate those uh, problem lists that the family docs had painstakingly created so um, it was a, a a very good learning uh, about what to not do with the problem list and and i think those are some of the things that we want to talk about today you know how to how to save people from mistakes how to help people better understand how to get the most of their ehr and how to get the most out of that problem list. Yeah, Amanda, I love those examples, and they're certainly similar to the ones that we hear kind of across the country as uh, we're talking to people um, uh, about our solutions. Um, and I wonder too, um, if the transition from paper to electronic exacerbated some of those problems. You know, if you, if you some of those issues, if you think about the paper world, I've got a little problem list and maybe it's very, you know, exactly the way that uh, Larry Weed wanted it to be and it was kind of perfect and I manage it, but I was the only one that kind of owned it. Then we go to an electronic world where the computer can not only aggregate everything, but he remembers everything. So now all of the stuff that can land on that problem list is increased by an order of magnitude. Um, and uh, so the problem list, if it's not managed at all, uh, just becomes kind of an attic of everything that whoever configured the electronic health record uh, decided to put on there. So um, having said that, um, let me move to our first poll question. Um, this is a question about who maintains the patient problems at your organization. All right, so if everyone could direct their attention to the screen, who currently maintains patient problem lists at your org? Is it the primary care physician, specialty physician, clinical support staff or nursing, hospitalist or nobody? And I'll give you a few seconds to respond. Okay, it's looking like primary care physician is, is winning here. Go primary care. <laughs> okay. I think we'll I can probably hear. I can probably hear a few primary care physicians saying that's not a victory, that one more thing <laughs> has landed on my desk. There you go. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close out. Back Thanks, Jordan. Um, that, uh, that last answer there around nobody was one that I put on there because uh, I think if some organizations are being honest, uh, that might be uh, one of the commonest things that, that we see is that there really isn't any central management. And so that kind of segues into our idea of, well, where do you start? And as Amanda and I were talking about what we should address today, uh, one of the things that kind of bubbled to the top is this idea that we're not gonna get anywhere if we don't have some kind of structured approach. And if you have a structured approach, you need some kind of governance. You know, at, at some level, problem lists are supposed to be absolutely central to our healthcare flow. The problem list, as I see it, and as you know, there are many organizations that have weighed in on what the problem list should be and how it should be used and how it should be managed. But as I think about it as a clinician, it's really my, my pivot point for taking care of the patient. It's where I wanna go to say, all right, you know, here's what this patient came in with. Here's the neighborhood of the complaints. If they came in with a cardiac complaint, here's their cardiac neighborhood. 
And then uh, beyond that, I have to do things like, you know, balance billing off it and so on. And so if we can get that right, we can improve a lot of things. You know, we can improve clinician satisfaction. Um, I talk to very few clinicians across the country who are really happy with the problem list and how it works for them. You sometimes have to spend a lot of time parsing through it just to be able to focus on what you're supposed to focus on. It's not bringing you that clinical picture that you're looking for. Um, we sometimes get asked at IMO, well, you know, give us an ROI if you think that we should improve the problem list. What, what's our ROI out of that? And that's a difficult question to answer, but one of the reasons that it's difficult is among the things that weighs into the value of a problem list is patient safety. How do you give somebody an ROI around something that they missed and maybe didn't even know they missed because the problem list wasn't managed correctly and didn't give them the right clinical picture of the patient? And then I think workflow in the modern electronic health record is important to everyone. Uh, if there's one complaint that's consistent across every single vendor, it's that, hey, you know, I can use your electronic health record reasonably well for billing. It doesn't help me in my clinician workflow. Um, but billing is important. And it, we have observed at IMO that, that for organizations that can get their hands around the problem list and manage it correctly, it does have a direct and an indirect effect on reimbursement because if a patient comes in to see me, I have to be able to focus on the right problems to get those problems over onto the, the diagnosis bill, the diagnosis encounters that I'm gonna put on the bill to send that patient out the door. About five years ago when I came to IMO, um, I was assigned the task of coming up with, well, you know what, what, what should the problem list look like? Uh, and just let me say upfront, this is not our solution for what the problem list should look like. I just wanna make the point that most of us have in our heads uh, what the problem list should do for us. You know, if we can manage it properly, how would it present that patient to us? You know, well, it would let me easily put into focus the things that I'm dealing with for that specific encounter. If a patient's seeing me in the ambulatory clinic or if I'm seeing them in the hospital, I need to be able to get to a particular problem that that patient has. I might need some kind of baseline of what, what affects everything that happens to that patient, you know, MRSA or diabetes or, or morbid obesity, those sorts of things that are kind of baseline things that set the status of that patient. And then I need to be able to have in, in my head from the, gleaned from the problem list, a fairly rapid clinical picture overall of what's going on with the patient. But we're not there in the electronic world yet. We never would have gotten there in the paper world um, but the question is where to start. If you have an idea in your head of how the problem list should work, where should you start? So as Amanda and I were talking about this, you know, we thought that governance is probably the first step because whatever ideas you have within the constraints of what you can do in your electronic health record or what you have in your head about how that problem sh list should work or what should be on it, you're not going to get anywhere if you can't get your organization sort of on board with, with uh, where you wanna go. What kind of things need governing? Um, when we talk to our customers, it's amazing how often the same issues come up over and over again. The first obviously is the governance structure itself. You know, Who's in charge of the clinical record at this particular organization? And, and if, if there's one person in charge, do they have a number of other people gathered together could kind of tackle the issue around the problem list. Who should be allowed to manage the problem list? We get questions all the time. Uh, you know, should I have my nurses be allowed to uh, edit the problem list, to look at it, PAs, uh, physicians, one physician managing somebody else's problems, editing somebody else's problems, what should be on it? Amanda already made the point that if you just decide you're gonna collect every single thing that was put against uh, that patient into the problem list, you're gonna probably end up with a big, long, cluttered list of uh, diagnoses that might be on there for the purpose of billing or that are transient in nature that are cluttering up your problem list. So what should be on it? The next point there about the allowable displays is near and dear to me here in Colorado because one of my colleagues here in Colorado that, uh, that we have as a customer 
um, it's pretty determined that her clinicians, she's the medical director, her clinicians should be required to examine the entire problem list. But a lot of electronic health records will let you package up the problem list so that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm an ophthalmologist, just let me see the ophthalmology stuff. Or you know what, if I don't get paid properly, uh, there's no point in me coming to work. I only want to see the chronic problems that are HCC related and so on. And electronic health records can sometimes do that. So one of the governance issues is what are we going to allow as an organization for how to actually display that list? And then I think the last point uh, that we hear commonly is, uh, well, what can my electronic health record do? And you have to have an idea in mind of what it can do uh, before you can create any governance around what you're going to allow it to do, whether or not the electronic health record can actually do that. Let me take a pause here and turn to the next poll question that we have, uh, which is where your organization has focused its own governance efforts. Thanks, Jim. All right, so where has your organization focused its governance efforts? Was it in the physician advisor group? Designate an owner for the problem list? Reduce clutter and cleanup list? Uh, focus on initiatives like HCC or RAF scores? Still working on how to approach this. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to respond. So it looks like a majority of those are saying still working on how to approach this, which, which makes sense. Okay, five more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close out, thank you. Okay, well, I'm not surprised that it's a fairly common answer to say, you know, we're still trying to figure out how we bring governance to a problem list. And that's really kind of the meat of uh, what I'd like to address today, today um, by bringing Amanda into this uh, discussion. Uh, she has a lot of experience out there in the real world. So we thought that we'd kind of cover a few of the topics around how to develop a governance strategy. So this uh, first consideration, Amanda, can you talk to this for just a little bit? Yeah, certainly. The, uh, you know, figuring out what do you want to get out of your problem list, I think, is, is very important. A lot of us that have lived through some of the uh, transitions and evolutions in the healthcare industry over the last decade or so, um, e even more than a decade now, when we think back to the dawn of, of meaningful use, is we had these external goals that were forcing us in one direction or another. So, you know, first of all, just to implement a problem list and then to maintain an up-to-date problem list. And then we had the whole um, ICD-9 to ICD-10 transition that, that impacted things. And I think so many of us have spent such a long time just reacting to external pressures. And now we have a time to really think about what do we as an organization want to get out of this? So, for example, um, do we want to use that problem list uh, to help drive the need for uh, ongoing care or ongoing services? Do we want to drive use the fact that someone has diabetes uncontrolled on their problem list to uh, reach out to them to use our patient engagement solutions or our other uh, technology to try and get those patients more involved in their care, get them in, uh, get them under more control? That's one strategy that organizations may want to do. Um, they also may want to use those problem lists to help risk stratify people for uh, morbidity and mortality. So, you know, COVID is a prime example of that. Can we mine the problem list to find those patients that are most at risk and engage them around vaccines or engage them around um, healthy behaviors, et cetera? Um, we can also use those problem lists to drive uh, preventable harms efforts. So, if you're part of an integrated delivery network and that patient comes in, using what's already in the problem list from the ambulatory setting to inform the care that you're going to deliver in the acute setting uh, to make sure that we identify people that are higher risk for things like deep venous thrombosis or, or other complications just related to hospitalization, having that whole background on the patient is really important. Uh, and to, to do that, you need an up-to-date problem list. Um, but the big thing for me is that uh, often focusing on that problem list helps it make it easier for clinicians to do the right thing. You have all those data points, you're not missing anything. Um, you can take full advantage of the EHR, things like drug disease checking that will help make sure that you 
are aware when you make a prescription that you know it's not interacting with a patient's known condition or something like that. There are so many different goals around a problem list, and I think it's important for organizations to pick a couple of things that they want to focus on. Um, none of us can boil the ocean, especially with everything else that's going on in healthcare today, but to try and identify maybe one, two, three maximum goals that we want with the problem list, um, and then to look at the problem list critically around those factors and to try and identify how the current situation of the problem list either helps those goals or hinders those goals. So that's kind of the first step is what do you want to get out of it and how is your current problem list serving or not serving those goals? Yeah, I, I love that point about analyzing what you have right now. Um, two observations I'd make um, kind of from the vendor perspective talking to customers. Um, one is it's actually quite hard to get customers to, uh, to get people using the who are using the electronic health record, uh, customers in our case, um, to get a good baseline. I mean, it's surprising, you know, it's sort of one of those things, well, why, why do I really have to do that? But if you don't know what's on there now, if you don't make some effort to analyze your current problem list, you don't have any idea of where your gaps are in the first place. Um, a second um, kind of point from the real world from my perspective, we, uh, we were given um, a list about three weeks ago from a major academic institution of the 800 or so most commonly entered problems on their problem list. And they were looking for a really simple thing. It happens to be one of our solutions, but they kind of, uh, you know, were dealing with the same thing, which is, you know, how do I get a problem to display in such a way that it's easy for the clinician to, to see, say, all the cardiac stuff or the pulmonary stuff or whatever. And their electronic health record was able to do it. And they, I think, had probably made the assumption that it wasn't perfect, but, you know, they'd never really analyzed it. When they analyzed it and we helped them do the analysis, a quarter of their problems weren't going anywhere. They weren't, you know, you'd think that maybe you saw the GI stuff and uh, and it, it wasn't there under GI. And another quarter of the remaining problems weren't going to the right place. So, you know, something that should be under cardiac, under, under neurology. And, um, you know, yes, IMO can help you with that, but we're not really talking about our solutions today. What I want to talk about is, if you don't analyze what you have in the first place, you literally don't know. And I would say customers are consistently surprised when they take the time to do an analysis or do some kind of baseline study at how differently those problem lists are getting presented to their clinicians for the things that their clinicians want to do with it from what they think is happening because they didn't do the analysis. Um, then I think the next thing we want to chat up a little bit is this idea about identifying gaps in your problem list, Amanda. Yeah, I think this is the point where, you know, an organization needs to look at those goals that they've outlined and then just kind of look at some sample problem lists or, or analyze the data and see how those things line up. Um, the things that I see a lot of, and I know a, a couple of these I've already mentioned, uh, number one, allowing self-limited problems to clutter up that problem list. So. Um, the EHRs now have great features to be able to uh, move those problems to a resolved state or an inactive state. And I think being able to actually, you know, make use of the technology to do that, I think that's really important so that people can use the filters and, and view the active problems, view the, the most critical problems. Um, and some of the systems are actually quite sophisticated. They can actually allow you to rank uh, the problem list uh, in the, the things that are most critical for clinicians to see uh, at the most prominent point in the view. Um, another thing that I see a lot of just a gap is that uh, sometimes those problem lists don't identify who's responsible for the problem. So we saw a lot of this uh, early on, especially with the ICD-9 to ICD-10 conversion, where data was just brought across um, through conversion efforts. And we'll see this sometimes when practices are acquired and brought on to a greater health system platform um, where the data just comes in and there's no indication of who's responsible for it. Um, and it's not always in, as intuitive as people think. So, you know, when I look at a problem of diabetes and maybe the patient has an endocrinologist and they have a family physician, um, but maybe they have some other endocrine problems as well. Maybe they have 
a, a bone mineral disease or something else, you know, I don't want to assume that the endocrinologist is managing the diabetes. A lot of family physicians manage a lot of diabetes in, in the United States and around the world. So I think it's really important to know who's responsible for those problems. So that's a big potential gap. Um, in that same vein, sometimes a gap in the problem list is the specificity level that problems are entered under. So for example, um, if a subspecialist sees the patient for the first time, uh, they may put in just some very general problems to cover things that the patient listed on their health history. Um, so maybe they just put in, you know, diabetes unspecified. Um, and then it's up to uh, someone who has more knowledge of the problem to refine that problem list to, you know, change it. You know, is this diabetes with renal involvement? Is this diabetes with ocular involvement? You know, what's what's going on with that? So there's that level of not only making sure that all the problems are represented, but they're represented at the appropriate level of specificity and tagged to the appropriate provider. Um, I also see in that same vein, sometimes there's a gap in the problem list where those are not updated when the clinical status changes. So maybe that diabetes was under control and something has happened and now it's poorly controlled. Um, so, you know, some of these are technical things. You obviously want to have systems that make it easy for you to document the progression of a problem. And some of them are strictly operational. So having policies and guidelines around how often that problem list should be reconciled, or even in, in this age of interoperability, how do we reconcile it during transitions of care? You know, somebody comes in from a hospital visit, somebody transfers from another location, but we have access to their records uh, because we're part of a greater or national health system. Um, those are things that, that we see. Um, but I think one of the bigger issues, though, there's the technical piece, and then there's also the operational piece. So sometimes the gap in the problem list is a people problem. And that's what Jim alluded to earlier about defining who's going to address the problem list, who's going, who's going to operationally support the things that I just talked about. So who's going to move those things from one level to another? Who's going to reconcile? Um, and I know there's a question in the, in the chat that I'll go ahead and pick off. Um, there's a question about how do physicians feel about other people making changes to the problem list, whether it's a coder or whether it's, uh, you know, a support staff member. And I think the answer is it depends. It, and it depends on how your organization defines the roles and responsibilities around that. So what level of people are allowed to do those things? Is it a certified professional coder? Is it, you know, does it have to be a registered nurse? Can it be a medical assistant? Um, is it not tied to title? Is it, you know, only the most experienced people in the practice are allowed to do those updates? Or is it we're going to train everybody to do those updates? So I think when, when physicians are comfortable with the level of training and accountability of other people doing the problem list, I think we're very comfortable with it. Um, we always encourage organizations to allow people to work at the top level of their license, which means allow people other than the physician <laughs> to do some of the work. Um, I always, and I have a hard time sometimes working with physicians and explaining to them, you have to let your clinical support staff support you. Uh, so, it, so it goes both ways, but that's a big gap I see is, is expecting one person or one class of user to do all the work um, when there's, there's a lot of different operational ways to slice and dice it, as well as the different technical considerations. Yeah, let me pick up on that last point about um... That, that you're making about sort of who should edit the problem list and whose problems should they edit. Um, and uh, I, I think you laid out the issues really well from, from my perspective as a vendor that sees both ends of the spectrum. Hey, I didn't want anybody to touch my problem. Hey, how can you get the electronic health record itself to automatically fix the problem list, which is kind of the, the far end of the editing spectrum, right? Is just have it have it done automatically. To our point of governance here, to me, that's exactly the kind of thing that you need to bring with your organization and its personality and its leadership to some kind of central governance and say, okay, you know, this is the way we're going to do it here at Smith Hospital, you know, um, because those issues, uh, you see such a broad spectrum of of opinion, even within an organization, uh, you know, across the whole organization, and without any governance at all, what happens is you never get anywhere. So without weighing in on which of those is the right approach necessarily, I'd let you do that as somebody closer to the, the clinical field. You know, my observation is um, point one is uh, you need some governance around it because it isn't going to be an opinion that's shared by everybody across your organization. 
then that kind of segues a little bit into the next issue that we wanted to raise here, which is to understand how your electronic health record, meaning the, the capabilities that are brought to you by your vendor, you know, how does that handle problems and what's possible? Um, one observation I want to make up front from the, the vendor perspective is that vendors really do listen to their customers. And so uh, one piece of advice sort of that I would have around here is, you know, you're, you're, it, it, it isn't that you're going to be able to just go to your vendor and say, look, put these three things on your dev timeline and, and have them done in six months. But when that vendor is sitting down and they're deciding what should this electronic health record be able to do with respect to any clinical function, one of their most important drivers, aside from the regulatory drivers uh, that they don't have any choice about, uh, one of their most important drivers is what are their customers saying about where that EHR needs to go. So I offer a little vendor perspective here and say it's really important to understand uh, how your electronic health record can work right now for how it handles the problem list. Uh, but it's also important to say, um, I'm going to maintain a channel of communication with my vendor so that going forward, the things that I want to see really are affected in their dev timeline. And I know, Amanda, you've had the opportunity over your career to work with a number of different electronic health record. So um, I'd like you to weigh in on this point too about just sort of understanding how not every electronic health record works exactly the same. They can't all be configured exactly the same. And maybe it is important to understand what you, what the possibilities are for your particular iteration of the electronic health record. Yeah, absolutely. In, in my travels, you know, I'll see organizations on the exact same version of the exact same EHR, and it behaves completely differently depending on how many features are user configured, how many features are uh, organizationally configured, and then also kind of the policies and procedures around that as well. Um, and I do want to second uh, the comment, Jim, that you made about be in touch with your vendor about what you need as far as enhancements, what you want to see as far as enhancements because the voice of the customer is really important. I've spent some time on the vendor side as well as on the health system side, and we need to hear that and we need to hear from uh, from multiple clients. And if you're part of affinity organizations, you know, like primary care organizations or community health organizations, sometimes it helps to bring those voices together to make sure that there's a cohesive ask for common things that many clients want as opposed to things that are a little more kind of freestanding or one-off. So um, definitely continue that dialogue with your vendor because uh, you know we, we do when we're wearing the vendor hat, we wanna hear that. But going back to the, the health system side, which is where I spend uh, a lot of my time right now, um, things that I see are organizations, you know, sometimes the pace of change with software is very high. So you may have taken an upgrade and maybe you didn't take the, the newest features or maybe the newest features were there and you didn't turn them on. Um, sometimes I think it's useful to kind of just go back and review the documentation around a particular feature area. So review the, the current training that your vendor offers for problem list. See if there's any bells and whistles that you're not taking advantage of um, and understand uh, how you can use some of the different things. So for example, filtering the problem list, sorting the problem list, reordering the problem list. Um, if you don't know for sure all the capabilities that you have, um, it's difficult to put those into practice. Um, other things that I would look for in the documentation, just uh, things for how easy it can be to update those problem list uh, items, uh, whether they can be at, truly edited or whether they have to be kind of like resolved and replaced. You know, make sure that people are aware of the easiest ways to do those things in the workflow. Um, and then also make sure that you understand what the different kinds of permissions are. So for example, you could have certain levels of users that are allowed to just you know, check that they reviewed it. Certain levels can actually edit. You know, maybe you only allow certain levels of users to delete, but just take a moment, review that documentation, or if your vendor offers any supplemental training classes, or if you're planning to attend a vendor user group meeting, uh, that's a great time to maybe send somebody from your organization to a little bit of additional training to make sure you fully understand how to get the most out of your, your system investment. Thanks. Um, if, if I had just one thing to offer uh, the vendors who actually create the electronic health record, um, it would be this. The, the problem list shouldn't be confined to a tiny little box. Um, there are a whole lot more things beyond that, but I will just add as a little free editorial here. One of the things that drives me crazy is this 
this thing that's supposed to be absolutely central to the to patient care has historically in some electronic health record been a little tiny window, you know, over on some one tenth of the screen or something. I think that's changing a little bit, but I just thought that I'd throw that in there. So if we're going to start somewhere um, with with this idea of governance, it seems to me like it probably not just a governor sitting somewhere saying this is the edict from above about what to do. Uh, and I think this is another point that you thought was fairly um, germane to this discussion, Amanda. So let me have you address this point if you don't mind. Absolutely. So I, I am a big fan of putting together task forces to address these things. And, and even though our header here says clinical task force, um, it needs to include people other than clinicians, just because as we mentioned earlier, there's so many different things tied to the problem list. So we know that billing is tied to the problem list, utilization is tied to the problem list, then there's all the technical components like the, the permissions, the rights, responsibilities, uh, all of that on the IT side. And often when I see organizations try to create governance around this, they have these task forces where they don't have the right people in the room. So you really need to have all those constituents. Um, and, and sometimes the one that you wouldn't think is the most important ends up being the most important. And I'll give you an example. Um, an organization I worked with was going to task the primary care physicians with uh, maintaining the problem list. And as you can imagine, they weren't 100% uh, thrilled with being the, the people that were solely on the hook for this. But one of the operational folks brought up that they were going to provide some additional compensation for the, the uh, primary care providers for this extra work. So if those operational people would not have been at the table, that could have been easily derailed into you know, just a bunch of grumbling. And, and I think also for the operational people to be able to hear what some of the nuances were with maintaining that problem list and the extra work, you know, that's what kind of spurred them to do some additional compensation for those primary care physicians. So you really have to have the whole village to make this work, um, but also not just the people with the titles, it's really important to get those informal clinical leaders as part of your task force. So maybe you've got that physician who is not a department chair or not a division chair, but they're the person that like everybody kind of lines up behind. You know, they know that when Dr. So-and-so gets on board that, you know, that they've made a calm, logical, rational decision. Um, look for those people and make sure that they're included on your uh, task force as well. Um, that can also just help avoid a lot of problems because those uh, informal leaders will hear things in the field that maybe a department chair or someone like that uh, or a C-suite person might not hear. And often they can, can help advise around potential pitfalls before you get to them. Um, also make sure uh, that if you are going to do kind of a major, if your task force decides to do a major cleanup effort, you may have to have additional staffing, and that needs to be something that the task force discusses as well as the governance. So, you know, if we're going to do this big cleanup, do we need to bring in some temporary resources to help, et cetera? So you have to have everybody at the table. So uh, when you say everybody at the table, um, you know, I, I, I totally get it that it needs to be more than just physicians. But I also wonder sometimes, um, if we need to do a better job when we're doing these kinds of advisory councils uh, or clinical task force, whatever you want to call it, um, if we need to do a better job making sure that the various physician roles as well are represented, um, you know, so so if if you decide, um, let's just say as a matter of policy, okay, uh, all our family practitioners are going to be the ones who sort of do an overview of the problem list every time a patient comes in. So in that sense, however you want to summarize it, they own the problem list. Uh, you know, an example anxiety there as well, you know, uh, our ophthalmologist put seven uh, eye terms on the list and, you know, I'm not messing with his stuff. So it feels to me like at that table of, for the, the clinical component, the, the nurses and the PAs and the, and the primary care docs that might end up being tasked with actually sort of making sure the problem list looks pretty good, for that patient, that there ought to be representation across the rest of the specialties as well for the physician roles, because it does feel to me that like that's a pretty consistent, sensitive topic of you know touching somebody else's problem uh, in service of getting to a better problem list, a cleaner one, for example. Yeah, absolutely. You really have to make sure that you have a, a good cross section, and again, those formal leaders, the informal leaders you know, maybe include folks that both practice full-time and part-time, 
um, because their impressions of it are going to be different. So you want to make sure that your task force truly is a cross section of the, the folks involved. Okay, so one of the ideas I had along the way uh, of my uh, clinical career is that if we got in a really good strategy for what the problem list should be, that, um, that we could farm out the idea of a more perfect problem list to maybe just one guy. You know, so a patient comes in to get seen in the clinic um, or maybe even comes into the hospital and when somebody opens up their problem list, it's this beautiful, uh, perfectly organized, um, appropriately sparse and appropriate complete uh, problem list. And I kind of think that's probably not the world's greatest idea, probably not the only bad idea I've ever had. Um, but if we say, okay, that's not going to happen, um, then then who who should own the problem list? I guess is the way most of our customers would would describe this problem that this issue that I've I've put on here. Whose problem is the problem list? Who should own it, Amanda? Who should be the final arbiter of of what that what's on that particular problem list? Yeah, I, I think the, the answer on that is is also a solid, it depends, and it depends on what's defined by your organization. So I have seen it work very successfully in a multitude of different ways. The key is to just make sure that it's defined so that everyone is operating under the same rules of engagement. So for example, uh, one, one uh, organization I worked with recently, um, the uh, primary care physician was responsible for doing a full reconciliation when the patient came in for, say, a health maintenance visit. And when I say primary care physician, not necessarily the physician, a member of their staff, maybe it's done during the pre-visit uh, planning process, maybe it's done during the intake, maybe it's done during part of the visit, um, but they were responsible for a full visit, and then the subspecialists were responsible for the more specialty-specific portions of the problem list. So, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I think to some degree, the folks that are diagnosing people with a new condition, it's, you know, it's your responsibility to, to make sure that goes on the problem list appropriately with the right level of granularity. Um, but just defining who's supposed to do it periodically, how often it's supposed to be done, because that problem list is really just a snapshot in time. It's only as good as the patient's next visit. Um, when something has changed or a status has changed. So uh, you may have one person responsible for the bigger chunk of it, but then everybody is responsible for interim updates or incremental updates. So um, there is no one right answer. It depends on your organization, depends on, on your patient flow. Um, but as long as it's documented and as long as it's working well and you revisit it from time to time to make sure it's working well, because what went well at the beginning of an implementation might not go well three visits or uh, I'm sorry, three years from now when an organization has evolved and maybe they've moved from being a primary care group to a multi-specialty group, that task force needs to convene periodically just to make sure that what they've decided is still valid and still working. Yeah, those are those are great points. And, you know, from my perspective uh, um, on the, the vendor side, I certainly hope going forward, uh, as we see more emphasis on the problem list and more functional utility coming from a well-managed uh, problem list that the electronic health record itself will have an increasing uh, capability of how to manage and display and present the problem list beyond just a list of what we decide is supposed to be on there. You know, internally here at IMO, for example, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Gold, has done a lot of work around some of the things that in theory it's possible for the electronic health record to do, things like rolling up problems um, so that they evolve over time, you know, started with a fever, then a cough, then pneumonia, or merge problems under a larger category. You know, this guy's got seven different diabetic retinopathies that might individually be important to the ophthalmologist, but at the level of the problem list, we can kind of have those subsumed under a bigger title of just diabetic retinopathy for the sake of everybody that's looking at it that's not the ophthalmologist. And some of those kinds of capabilities around things like presenting the problem list and getting rid of problems automatically that were transient in nature to begin with and so on, I think as the electronic health record evolves and as it becomes more focused on how useful a problem list could be and how valuable that therefore makes that electronic health record to the user, 
um, you know, I think some of these issues that we have uh, around, well, gee, this is what's supposed to be on it and, and you know, nothing else um, will be improved. Um, and then um, this is another point that's near and dear to my heart, Amanda, but I'll let you talk about it first. As I said, kind of at the front end, uh, one of the struggles that we've had on the vendor side is getting our customers to measure a baseline in the first place. You know, so how do we actually measure progress? You know, we decide, all right, we're gonna tackle this issue. Right now, nobody at our organization owns a problem list and we don't have any good governance in place yet. We'd like to get there with some of these ideas, but everybody wants to be able to say, and I think legitimately so, okay, uh, this, is, this was our initial state and this is our current state, and this is the advantages and the progress that we've made. So, so what are some of the things around measuring that progress? Yeah, I think measurement is absolutely critical, and also to know where you are on the baseline before any intervention. So uh, different metrics that I've seen organizations uh, look at include, uh, has the problem list been reconciled in X amount of time compared to when the patient's been in for a visit? So for example, um, if the patient hasn't been in for a visit in six months, of course, the list probably hasn't been reconciled. But if the patient's had three visits in the last six months, what percentage of the time was that problem list addressed? Um, that's one way to approach it. Another way that I see people approach it is um, for the fields that can be captured to supplement the problem list or support the problem list, what percentage of the time are they blank? So, for example, how many problems are there that don't have an associated physician responsible for managing those? So those attribution issues, you know, is that going to be something you're going to focus on is cleaning up that attribution? Um, that's that's something that's fairly easy to report on. Um, and those reports, they're best if they're done kind of regularly so people can see if they're making progress. Um, sometimes organizations will generate reports uh, that are just a to-do list. You know, they are the list of the most uh, problem problematic problem lists, shall we say, that need immediate attention, maybe some of the most complex patients or patients that are in active case management or um, very medically complex patients. You know, maybe they invite people to do a short-term cleanup on those. Um, so I think it can it can be anything you want it to be based on your organization's goals. So if if attribution is one of your key goals, then look at those, develop some reports, run them regularly, let people know how they're doing. Um, if it's just a case of getting people to look at the problem list, uh, those are very different interventions than getting people to add more data to the problem list. So uh, report frequently, uh, but not too frequently. Like you don't need a daily report or a weekly report. You know, every month or two is probably enough just to let people know how they're doing. Um, and also, you, you know, celebrate people that are doing well. Sometimes you can gamify this a little bit and that tends to motivate people uh, to be able to work through it. And also make sure that you tie back those measurements to the importance of the patient. So, you know, getting those lists more accurate, it's about patient safety, it's about preventable harms, and telling those stories about good saves that happened because the problem list was accurate. You know, maybe someone prescribed a medication that, that otherwise would have gone through if not for an accurate problem list. Make sure that you're making those successes known because that helps people remember the why behind why we're doing this. We're not doing it because administration asked us to do it. We're doing it because that patient that's represented in the problem list is someone's mother or grandmother or sister or cousin or you know loved one. And and really tying that back, I think, is important. Yeah, I I love that. I think our observation uh, at IMO in working with customers who are who are actively trying to improve their problem list is that that regardless of what they decide to measure for their baseline um, and regardless of what specific initiatives they have the customers that are focused on measurement are the ones who are most successful um, there there seems to be a tie between saying look we're going to follow this we're going to see how our progress is uh, and actually making an improvement and some of our most successful customers in terms of getting a cleaner list or avoiding um, uh, avoiding a dirty list down the road or you know getting rid of transient problems and so on are the ones who are focused on not just saying okay gee let's do this and letting it go but focused on actually measuring it because that helps drive the initiative I think to completion um, okay a couple comments about some key takeaways uh, and then uh, we'll see if we've got a few minutes left for for uh, questions so 
the first takeaway I think is to put a strategy in place. Might not be perfect out of the box, but get together a group of, of uh, people, clinicians and non-clinicians, as Amanda mentioned earlier, figure out what your goals are, figure out where you're gonna start and what your baseline is, put some kind of strategy in place, uh, including um, what you're going to do to drive this behavioral change throughout the organization. Yeah, definitely having that task force is so important and making sure that the communication coming out of the task force is solid. Make sure that people know uh, what's going on, what are the changes that are going to happen, what the expectations are, what the timelines are. Uh, those are really critical to helping go through that change leadership process and make sure that everyone feels that they have ownership and this is important as opposed to something they're just being told to do. And then I think creating accountability is important. Um, you know, this is such a uh, personality dependent thing, right? It depends on the personality, for example, of your CMO and your CMIO, if they're at the top of this uh, governance chain in your organization. Um, and it depends on the personality of your clinician. Sometimes whole organizations have a certain kind of kind of average personality of, for example, how independent the clinicians are or how, how um, malleable the clinicians are in terms of governance efforts. Um, I don't think accountability has to be, um, you know, we're going to dock your pay if you can't get there. Um, I think accountability can be created in quite a number of ways. Um, one of the most effective ones I've seen, for example, is just a simple posting of how we're doing. Um, and in the case of my home shop, uh, in in the the docs lounge, you know, how, here's our initiative. How are we doing? It's surprising how accountable clinicians will get when they can see what's actually happening at their organization against the strategy that they helped um, initiate because they were involved with the task force at the front end. Yeah, I think that measurement of the progress, you know, defining the desired outcomes and measuring that progress is so important. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have to change the goals. You know, sometimes those goals top out or we discover that there's something that's a blocker that's keeping us from meeting that goal and making sure that we explain to, to folks when we do adjust those goals. Um, I think that's really important. And, and the, the posting in the doctor's lounge that I actually was in an organization recently that was doing a cl clinical improvement and they actually had like the old fashioned uh, outline of a thermometer drawn, you know, and they were, you know, moving it, coloring in the red every week, you know, as they were, were reaching their goals. And, you know, it seems like kind of a, just a cheesy visual, but people were really into it, you know, like what does the thermometer look like? Um, and I, again, I just want to remind people to celebrate the successes. This is hard work and this is, this is uh, work that a lot of people view as not exciting. You know, cleaning up the problem list, it just kind of sounds like a drag. So, uh, you know, make it make it uh, a part of your patient care mission, make it part of your patient safety mission and celebrate those successes. Communicate those places where uh, things went really well. Thanks, I see that we only have about six or eight minutes left. So Jordan, I'm gonna ask you if we have any questions that have come in and give a, a Amanda a chance to chat them up a little bit. Awesome, well, thank you both, that was, Fabulous. Um, so we do have one. So can you touch on how to recommend problem list management in a large multi-specialty practice? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of it depends on the culture of the practice in general um, and the kind of services that are going on in the practice and whether it functions more as a group practice or just a group of uh, multi-specialty physicians that are affiliated. So in practices that are more of a group practice, it seems to be a little bit easier to, to define that attribution and who's going to own it and, and how often is it going to be addressed. Um, a lot of times it will go to the primary care physicians, uh, but again, everybody has to do their part with that. Um, other folks want to do it just on a time basis. You know, the, you know, the first person to see the patient in any given month is responsible. Um, there's a lot of different strategies um, but I would I would look at kind of the characteristic of the practice, whether there's more of a primary care feel or whether the, the there's a lot of transitive patients. You know, if you have patients that are coming in for procedures, um, maybe orthopedic procedures, the man and maybe they're only seen in the practice twice, the management of that portion of the problem list is going to look a little bit different than folks that are providing um, ongoing care like rheumatologists, gastroenterologists, pulmonary physicians, nephrologists. So 
Um, I think it's just a question of getting everybody in the room and kind of starting to talk through it and figuring out what fits for the culture. Yeah, one comment around that for me, I think implicit in the idea of, well, what about a multi-specialty um, practice? Implicit in that question for me is the notion that, well, look, you know, I'm a primary care doc, so should I be touching somebody else's problem? We, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, and, you know, the reaction that I have to that is that, first of all, if we can get the problem list organized properly, if your electronic health record lets you organize problems by, for example, either a specialty or at least a clinical category, you know, cardiac, GI, endocrine, ophthalmology, whatever, um, then you do have the option of, of making it easier to kind of federate out not the whole problem list, but just say to your individual specialties and your multi-specialty practice, hey, you don't have to fix the whole problem list, but do me a favor, when that patient comes in for their orthopedic problem, take a look at the orthopedic problems and clean those up a little bit. So you offer the option, first of all, to the specialist who owns that set of problems and say, you know, you, you don't want somebody else touching these? No problem, just do me a favor and you clean them up. And then only if that fails, then, then you can turn and say, okay, well, now I'm going to have to let the primary care doc clean them up, even if you put them on there because you didn't want to do it. So I think there's sort of reasonable, politically efficient ways to take care of it that perhaps are in part dependent on what your electronic health record can do to categorize those problems uh, into the various um, entities that own them across your multi-specialty clinic. Um, anything else out there, Jordan? Yeah, so one is, can you comment on the ability for clinicians to tag problems to provide different views for individual clinicians? Oh, I'll, I'll totally take that one. Um, I, I think the ability to tag problems to a clinician or to a type of clinician or tag it to a specialty, I think that's tremendous. I think it makes it a lot easier to kind of sort the problem list and be able to see the things that are more critical. But I do want to challenge providers that it's still important to see the whole problem list, not just your problems, because um, maybe something has been added that you don't know about, but that's relative to your problem. So um, as a clinician, sometimes you can default those views to like when the problem list opens, you see everything, and then you can cone it down to the things that have been tagged to you. Um, I would encourage people to perhaps take that approach just to make sure that there's not something new um, the other thing that's really handy in the problem list uh, of many EHRs is to be able to sort them by when they were most recently updated. So looking at that filter and just trying to see what are any problems that have been updated, changed, or added since my last visit with the patient, and then you know that you're not missing anything. So um, I, I think there's a lot of good features uh, that are out there, and, and I would definitely encourage people to take advantage. Yeah, as, as a physician who works with a vendor who supplies sort of the ability to do either one of those. I'm gonna stay officially uh, neutral uh, on the topic, except to say that I agree with my colleague here in Denver that every clinician is responsible for everything that's on the problem list that might be germane to that particular patient. And, and so in some sense, you know, I think what an electronic health record can do is kind of let you focus on this area because that's your area of interest or, or specialty, but then also let you rapidly get through any other issues that might uh, be important. So, you know, take something as simple um, as a orthopedist getting ready to replace a knee. Well, you know, they don't have to know every single fine point that's going on with that patient, but they're certainly going to care about things beyond just ortho. They don't want to find that patient on the table with an elevated INR or with a cardiac arrhythmia that's relevant to the, the, that should have been cleared before the surgery and so on. So there is this kind of delicate balance between being able to focus on what I need to focus on as my specialty, but also having a responsibility as a clinician, almost no matter what my profession is, unless I'm a pathologist, to see what else is going on with the patient. Thanks, Jim. So we have actually two, you know, a few more questions left, um, and we're going to call this soon. But uh, two questions came in about how do physicians feel about coders making changes to the problem list? Coders doing what, Jordan? Making changes to the problem list. So 
Yeah, and, and I, I alluded to that one a little bit earlier. I think it, it, it falls into the category of if there are appropriate um, roles and responsibilities documented and what are the situations where coders can or cannot make changes, what kind of changes are okay without physician approval, what kind of changes need physician approval, I think it can be a valuable part of the support process and a valuable part of the reconciliation process. But I think a lot of physicians are, are resistant to just letting anybody of any title or, or class, you know, have unfettered uh, access to modifying the problem list. You have to have the roles and responsibilities around it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's absolutely great for ancillary folks to be able to help maintain that problem list where it makes sense. Yeah, I agree, Amanda. I would I would say briefly around that uh, feels to me like uh, coder, it, depending on your electronic health record, adding a diagnosis to the encounter that's going to be billed out is a subtly but important difference from changing the problem list itself. Um, and, you know, to your point that both of those kinds of lists exist in electronic health record. Great. Okay, one more question. Um, with patients having access to portals more, so like a my chart, um, it will become more of an issue for patient input. What has already been done to address this? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and weigh in on that. Um, having been someone who actually had something put in my chart that was wrong, um, a lot of the EHRs have the ability through the patient portal for patients to go ahead and put a comment on that. And uh, so not only seeing the problem in the problem list, is that an issue that may require correction or update, but especially since the spring, since the open notes initiative went into effect and now patients uh, have the ability to see their complete notes, not just the problem list or the summary type items that are in the portal, but actual visit notes. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot more discussion around uh, what goes in the notes and how those things are updated. But, um, at least what I've seen from the patient side is the ability to put a comment on a problem and ask that it be updated at the next visit. Um, I haven't seen from the patient side the patient being able to frankly make a change that flows all the way through, um, but you can certainly put a comment on it. So I, I think we'll see more of that, especially with the Open Notes Initiative. Absolutely. Um, uh, 20 years ago, we decided in my emergency department that the patient ought to get the entire health record. At the time, it was on paper. They went out with a copy of their ER visit. I think the patient ought to get everything, and I think a patient ought to be able to comment on everything. That's a different from literally changing the original electronic health record, uh, but certainly patient feedback, both from a regulatory standpoint uh, and a practical standpoint, should be supported. Okay, Jordan, I think we're out of time, and I don't want to yeah. run too far. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close out for today. We hope you found the information in today's webinar useful. Um, if you want any more information regarding IMO or our solutions, please contact your IMO client executive, or you can email sales at imohealth.com. Thanks so much for attending, and I hope everyone stays safe out there.